as you're aware, entrepreneurialism and innovation continues to grow as a huge theme here at Georgia Tech, and we have a number of units uh, under on campus to assist in them in the development of these, uh, such as Advanced Technology Development Center, which you're about to hear about, the Engage Fund, and of course you've probably heard of CreateX. So for those of you who are students, there are students that have come out of this program, um, both as undergrads and grads, and now are um, founders of billion dollar companies through working with these uh, programs. Um, so uh, if you're interested in innovation, incubation, entrepreneurialism, um, this is uh, your chance to, to learn more, so we encourage you to ask questions. Um, so with that, um, I'm very excited about the, the choice of companies. I care a lot about reverse logistics. I think Barbara's company is going to be, a, an, uh, for those of you interested in sustainability and those type of things, a, a wonderful fit there. And uh, Carpool Logistics, you know, I actually met my wife in a conference where she was uh, talking about some of the concepts they have, but um, a, a generation or two back on the technologies <laughs> that, that are going to be discussed today. So, as I mentioned, Advanced Technology Development Center, um, the state's incubator managed by uh, Georgia Tech, um, supply chain and logistics being huge in the state of Georgia. So Georgia Tech um, and ATDC were smart enough to hire an individual with deep career in supply chain and logistics, including starting up some very successful companies um, to focus on growing the community of startups in supply chain and logistics. So I'm gonna turn it over to that gentleman, uh, Mr. Alex Rodin. Is that the right way to pronounce it? It is. There it is. Okay, Alex, you gonna take it? Thank you so much, Tim. And uh, congratulations on those 10 years, but we're not celebrating you today. That's all next week. And, and thank you also to Andy for everything he did to uh, wrangle the operations and bring this opportunity here. Uh, very quickly, I'm Alex Rodine. I am the supply chain catalyst at ATDC. As Tim mentioned, it is the state of Georgia's uh, tech incubator for early stage founders who are building proprietary technology as both the founders that we have here today have done and are continuing to build. Uh, so very excited. Quickly about me, uh, after graduating college uh, at an institute far, far away from the great state of Georgia, I joined the Army and served there for a total of nine years. My first job when I left active duty on the civilian side was employee one as a, at a startup, and uh, I've stayed in early stage startups pretty much ever since. In 2014, I co-founded a company uh, here in Atlanta that uh, focused on last mile on demand delivery because it was 2014 and everyone was doing it. So gave into the peer pressure. It became a part of ATDC for two years until it was acquired by Geodis. Uh, in 2020, I left and started another supply chain company uh, based here in Atlanta with some business, business partners that I got to know through the Atlanta startup uh, ecosystem. So I'm very grateful for everything that Atlanta, Georgia, Georgia Tech, uh, and the entire ecosystem has done for me and my career and always happy to, uh, to come back and give you the scared straight stories on the reality of being an early stage entrepreneur. <laughs> I used to uh, espouse the virtues of it for everyone and realize too many people were getting in who didn't really have what it takes. So then I started to tell the story of it's 3 a.m., you've got payroll due the next day, you're not on it, you're also bootstrapping a company, so you're not exactly liquid. How do you make that payroll? 90% of the people look like they're gonna throw up. The 10% who you see the wheels turning, those are the folks where maybe early stage startups are for you. So, uh, and then the final way we will know if we are having an impact and hitting with uh, content that resonates, I've learned this after a few presentations at Georgia Tech, is as the laptops go down, you know you're hitting, and as they open up, you know, that's cancel culture. So, <laughs> thanks again for being here. We also have an audience online, I'm very grateful for that as well. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce uh, Mike Malikoff and uh, Barbara Brown-Jones, who we're gonna talk a little bit about their experiences, but first of all, let's start with you, Mike. Tell us three fun facts you'd like us to know about you. So Mike Malikoff, I'm founder of Carpool. Uh, three fun facts. Um, so I have lived in a communist country, socialist country, and a capitalist country. Wow. I came to the United States when I was 15 with $300 in my pocket by myself. And uh, what else? Um, started Carpool. That's a fun fact. <laughs> And Barbara? Hello, everyone. I'm Barbara Jones-Brown. And three fun facts about me. Um, first one is I'm a Gulf War veteran. Very proud of that. Um, military service like Alex. 
Um, second, I'm a technical founder, I have a computer science degree from the University of Texas at Austin. And the third fun fact is I'm a salsa dancer, so love to dance and get some of this stress off by doing my dancing. So. That's great, that's awesome. All right, so we're gonna dive in. Uh, so Mike, let's start off with you giving an overview of Carpool, how you came to recognize a need within the marketplace for your solution, mm -hmm. and where things sit today with Carpool. Yeah, so um, the automotive industry is just going through a tremendous amount of change. It's probably the biggest renaissance you're gonna see in automotive than you've seen in the last 50 years. Wow. You have uh, car manufacturers are everything's shifting to electric, right? That's a big one. You have consumers buying more cars online. And as electric cars come to market, a lot of those manufacturers are skipping the, the dealership route and going direct to the consumer. So instead of going to the dealership, browsing a couple hundred cars, you're going online and basically doing a lot of the shopping online. Um, so a lot of that is changing what logistics of vehicles looks like for car manufacturers, for dealerships, auto auctions. So they all are shifting more towards digital transactions. And with that, obviously, you know, vehicle is a physical good that needs to be moved and needs to be moved very efficiently. There's opportunity that we found that uh, there's an opportunity to more efficiently deliver vehicles. So historically vehicles have been, most of them are picked up at a dealership, right? It's not delivered to a consumer. So now all of a sudden you have convergence of long haul and short haul home delivery, which is very challenging. And if, if you spend time in the, in the freight world, it's, uh, you know, there's long haul, there's a middle mile, there's a last mile, there's a first mile. Now you have all of them kind of kiboshed together. And how do you deliver on that Amazon-like experience? If you're a consumer, you're used to, you know, a package just arrives and you can track it. And here you are buying a $50,000 car and you have no idea when it's gonna show up at your doorstep. So yeah. that's some of the challenges we're trying to solve. Uh, so at Carpool, we, we launched last May, so we're almost two years old in two weeks. Uh, and we, uh, we bootstrapped the business initially. We put, I have three other co-founders. We put 300 grand of our own money into the business, starting it. And then we, uh, we s sought considerable amount of success with auto auctions and dealerships and uh, even without going after the consumer segment first, it's all B2B for now, for most part. And we raised a, a $2 million seed round last summer with Atlanta Ventures. So continue to grow, we're building our products, so our, all our product is proprietary. Um, I can talk a little bit more about that, a little bit. Okay. Good job. All right, so Barbara, let's do the same for you. Let's get the overview and then we'll get into the questions. Yep, so um, um, I'm Barbara Jones, as you guys know. My product is called Freeing Returns, and we work with the retail space. So we work with uh, large retailers, whether they're online or in store, and our software looks at returns, um, returns to their bottom line and also physical returns back to that particular uh, retailer. Um, as you guys know, we're buying most of our stuff online nowadays. So it's not easy like it used to be where you can just walk in the store and return something. If you bought it online, where do you take it back? Do you need to drop it off somewhere? They pick it up. You need to coordinate that. Do you need to ship it back? And so that's the, the problem on our side, the consumer side. But imagine the retailer side. Uh, they got merchandise coming in, sometimes dropped off at stores, sometimes dropped off at different locations, sometimes coming back to warehouses, sometimes coming back what should have been a TV comes back as a soggy box that had dry ice in it because they didn't return the TV, right? Or it's got bricks, you know? So retailers are dealing with all kinds of issues uh, trying to handle return merchandise. One, they've lost the sale, so the money is already gone. Two, if it was a fraudulent return, they've now lost more than the sale because they've given money back to someone who really didn't buy it. Or three, um, if this is a, like an organized retail crime ring, then they have a really huge issue of this going on before it gets back to them. And now if it is merchandise that, that's returned, what do you do with it? Is that merchandise compromised? We saw with COVID, you know, is it who's been messing with it? Am I gonna sell it to somebody and they're gonna end up getting sick? Um, you know, where am I gonna take this merchandise? So when you start thinking about reverse logistics, when it comes to returns, it's a huge issue for retailers. And what we've seen is that for every dollar return, 
that retailers is, is losing $3 for every return they take back, uh, even to the point where some of them are starting to say, we won't even take it back, just keep it. Mm -hmm. We'll give you your money anyway, which right. the fraudsters love. That's like, oh wow, I don't even have to worry about shipping a box with bricks. I can just get my money back. And so what our software does is it takes that data. It's really a data analytics platform. We use AI, machine learning. We look at um, a retailer's data. Usually we pull in for new customers, we pull in about six months to 13 months of their historical data, seed our models. And then once we, they turn on our platform, we are able to give them alerts and information about these type of items that are coming back and the people that are returning them so that they can confidently say, we're not gonna take that return back and not be at risk at you know, making one of us mad who are, who are not doing something fraudulent. And so the software just gives them visibility. It helps them put money back in their pockets. It helps them decrease losses. And it's been like a really uh, a value add for retailers to be able to have this type of software um, to look at all this massive amount of data that they're collecting. So it's been a fun problem to solve, but a lot more to do. Every time we come up with a solution, the frosters think of a different way to get around it. And so it's a cat and mouse game, but it's been really fun working on this solution. Excellent. So uh, as most of us are aware, there's the Georgia AIM grant, uh, which is bringing $65 million to the state of Georgia uh, with a focus on AI manufacturing. And uh, there are several uh, pillars to what the, uh, the grant money is looking to do and support and focus on. We all know that sustainability is one of the most critical things right now, but let's talk supply chain resiliency and what within your solutions you're seeing about, as I think of resiliency, it, to me it's optimizing the supply chain. Exactly. Someone bought the word resiliency so they're getting paid a nickel every time people say it, but I just think of supply chain optimization. So uh, Barbara, we'll go to you first on this. How does your solution enable a more resilient or optimized supply chain for your customers? Yeah, I think the first thing it does is gives them that visibility because a lot of what's happening now, they can't see or they don't know. So first they have visibility into it so they, they can do something about it, first thing. Um, second thing is, you know, all kinds of, now that we know these type of solutions or issues exist, um, all kinds of different types of um, solutions are coming out. Um, I don't know if you guys have heard of a company called Happy Returns, but they basically work with retailers and allow them to be able to pick up return merchandise from maybe just your dry cleaning location, or maybe I think they have some even outside of Georgia Tech. Amazon does the same thing. You can drop things off. And so now we have this, you know, this nice convenience for customers, but it's also a way for these retailers to be able to um, have another party kind of look at this merchandise before it comes back. So for me, the resiliency is now we, we're aware of what's going on. We, we can start looking for solutions to fix it, and then we can do something about it. Uh, what a lot of retailers are able to do is if they are having uh, an item that's being returned a lot for a really good reason, they can recover that money from the vendor. So it's something called swell and reclaim. So as long as they know what's going on, they're able to track it, they know why items are being returned, they can give that to information to their vendors, and now they get money back from the vendor because this item is a problem. And so uh, that's another way that we help them find money because a lot of them are missing out on getting that reclaimed dollars. And now that they're tracking it, they know what's going on, they can get money back from vendors. So this is money coming in that allows them to buy replacement um, items. So for me, the resiliency is really awareness of what's going on, being able to track it, and now they know what to do about it. Great, and so Mike, same question to you and looking at your solution and recognizing that touching the sustainability side of life, the optimization side, the resiliency side, we all know that if something is going somewhere and every square inch isn't filled, that's not a great thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, absolutely, so one of the things that I you know, spent 16 years in the freight industry, so basically you know, sh shipping in containers and over the road in the US and also internationally. And that industry is a whole lot more optimized when they're shipping their pallets, because it's in you know, a pallets, you stack them, you're trying to optimize space as much as possible. You get into the automotive world and it's like madness. It's like 15 years behind, nobody's doing anything. These cars are, there's 40 million cars that get sold in the United States and that's just used. Wow. 16 million new cars. Those are more or less optimized because they're coming from a factory, they're going to the dealership, consumers buy, they go on. So those are more efficient. But 40 million used cars get exchanged annually that are scattered all over the country, right? 
And as those cars find a new life, so once you get rid of it and then somebody else finds a new life, those cars get repositioned. So let's say you walk into a dealership and you trade in your car, you just bought a new car. What happens to the used car? It, de it depends. So it depends if, if it's in good condition, the dealership may keep it on their lot. Does it align with their inventory? They may not. They may trade it to another dealership or they may sell it to at, at an auction. So they, they needs to, it needs to be shipped. So basically all these cars are scattered all over the place. Uh, and all these units, if you look around and you, you probably never pay attention to car haulers on the road, there's tons of them, but 40% of them have at least one empty space. Mm -hmm. Tons of empty space, not optimized. And these guys, there's the two sides, right? There's one, the, the trucker that's driving the, the driving the vehicles. They're generally, most of the population is a guy with an F-350 trailer, F-350 and a trailer that has no technology, that's making hundreds of phone calls, trying to optimize his truck, make some money, and put food on his family's table. So very inefficient on that end. And the customer that's paying for the transport is paying for all those empty spots that he didn't fill for his inefficiency. So a carpool for us, it's, you know, how do I help the trucker? Because a, he's a small business, he's an entrepreneur. How do we help him optimize his space on the trailer, make more money? And for the customer, you pay less if the truck's full. Mm -hmm. So both sides win in an equation when you're able to optimize this vehicle. So that's one part of it. So carpool is play on words. We pull cars, we don't pull people, right? <laughs> so, um, so that's one side of it is optimizing these vehicles. Now, that a lot more interactions are happening with the consumer. So let's say that you didn't bring the trade into the dealership. So the trade in is sitting in your driveway and the car got delivered to you. So now there's a leg of that car got delivered to you. Now we need to pick up that car from your trade in, go take it back to the dealership. The dealership is going to look at that car and say, mm, I don't know, I don't like it. Send it to the auction. So now we're sending the car to, to the auction. Then de another dealer buys that car. That car gets transported to that next dealer because for his, whatever the customer audience that dealer has, that car is perfect, right? So he's, he has it on his lot. Now he sells it to another consumer. That car needs to get shipped. So it's, mm. it's funny to see when in our system, we'll see the same car go That's through multiple phases <laughs> and where they go and how they get. So you, you gain a lot of data, right, through that. And then you try to optimize the data. How do, how do I, first of all, put all these cars together so we can ship them more efficiently? But then you're gaining all this knowledge about where are the cars going? So for dealers, where should we be selling these cars? If this car is not selling very well in Atlanta, Georgia, where is this asset going to get the most value? And how much is it going to cost to reposition it to that location? So we try to, try to build that uh, puzzle out. And then the other part is, like I mentioned earlier, as a consumer, you want to know where everything is at all times. I don't know why, but you want to know where everything is at all times. So <laughs> ability to track that vehicle, whether you're a dealership or a consumer, is an important fact because we're just used to the gadgets and we just want to see where it is because it's mm -hmm. cool. Uh, so that is the other part of like, how do we give the customer visibility of where is the car? When is it going to be picked up? When is it going to get delivered? So you, you feel good about that transaction. So the other uh, area of focus that we're going to address today is AI. Uh, for those of you who don't know, AI, according to headlines, was invented in February. So it's a very new technology. <laughs> Uh, those of you who have concerns about Skynet, I just want to clarify, it's not AI that's going to cause it, it's the machine learning that's going to get you. Yeah. So we see and hear about it all over the place right now, and yet OpenAI, eight years, 10 billion plus dollars, so this yeah. is another overnight success story that took almost 10 years to build. <laughs> uh, so Barbara, your solution, deeply reliant on AI and a huge part of your value proposition yes. uh, within the solution. So if you want to take us through the ways in which you're deploying it, what mm -hmm. you're building and what you're, <laughs> excuse me, seeing coming for future iterations of your platform yeah. relying on AI. Yeah, so I mean, AI for us, what we're using it for is really the algorithms that help us detect different types of loss. Um, returns is a big thing that we look at, but our, our application is really a total retail loss application. So we look at uh, not only returns, but we look at operational inefficiencies, we look at inventory issues, we look at spoilage, we look at um, you know uh, vendor management. And so we have a lot of data that is in the platform. And so what we use AI for is really to crunch through that data and give us these insights um, that we can pass back on to our customers. Um, so we're looking at data, we're learning 
from that particular retailer's data on you know, how to notify them earlier, faster, quicker. It's all about how do you catch this stuff either before it happens or right when it's happening so you can do something about it. So that's what we use AI for is really to crunch through the data to learn, to get better at our algorithms, get faster at being able to consume data and faster at being able to give out these alerts and notifications. And so what it's helped us do um, also for the front end of our clients is it allows them to be able to um, look through their data with like a Google type search. Um, usually they would have to learn how to write, you know, SQL, I don't know if you guys know um, that type of language, but a lot of these loss prevention professionals within retails would have to learn how to write SQL or they have to figure out a way to look through data. And now with AI, we can give them kind of like a Google search where they can just put in, I'm looking for, you know, anybody that did returns over $50 in the last 30 days. They can just type that in versus having to figure out a SQL query. And so now they're able to get through their data faster with just human-like language. And that comes from AI because now we can kind of, you know, look at these keywords, match them up to a query, and then run that query. So we're using it really crunching through data, learning from the data, giving back insights, and then enabling easy ways to query through this large amount of data that our customers are giving us. Excellent. All right, Mike, similar question. And I know your technology is a little bit less reliant on AI as you build out your platform, but I imagine there is a a key part that it will play in, in the growth of Carpool. Yeah, for sure. So there's a couple of different areas for us. Obviously, uh, you know, when we have all these mul these vehicles all over scattered, how do you optimize them? You got the, uh, what is it, the traveling salesman problem, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so we're trying to optimize those, all these scattered cars all over the place. Uh, and there's, you know, the few things that we're working on right now is, for example, it, you know, the transporter picked up three vehicles from Atlanta going to California. And he's got, we know he has one spot empty on his trailer. And all of a sudden, we get an order from a customer in, I don't know, let's say Birmingham, uh, that is going to a similar destination. He's already left, right? The order's complete. I mean, he's, he's already moving. How do we let him know, ping him in route? I'm like, hey, Bobby, you got a spot empty. Would you want to grab another one in Birmingham? Obviously, for a human to catch these things is very hard, especially when you're, moving vehicles at scale. Yeah. So that's one thing, one area that we're focused on. The other one is, so we're a marketplace. So we have a customer that's buying from us and then we are a transporter that's also, you know, we're, it's a buy-sell model. Mm -hmm. So in, in any buy-sell model, if you're a stock market, right, you need to create liquidity, fast, fast liquidity, meaning that somebody needs to buy and sell very quickly because if mm -hmm. the stuff is not buying and selling, you're not pricing it right. So pricing is a very big component of figuring out what li creates the liquidity very quickly. Uh, so playing with those models is very important to us. Is that, you know, if you have one car and going to a certain destination, nobody wants that one car because they haven't filled up their truck. Unless, until they fill up their truck, they're looking for others to match it up with. Mm -hmm. So if I have two, automatically the speed increases mm -hmm. and the cost goes down. Mm -hmm. So you're playing with all these models of speed goes up, pricing goes down, and you're trying to uh, optimize those. So that's an interesting problem that we're trying to solve for. Obviously, it's, you know, traveling salesman is not solvable, but yeah. <laughs> you can optimize and improve um, those. And that's kind of, those are the, some of the things that we're working on uh, on our end. So you, you use the H word, which is human, and obviously we're here to talk a lot about technology and all the ways in which it is a powerful tool for good or bad. Uh, but let's get back to the human component. So you both have had very, uh, your, your, your lives, your careers, all the things you've done, it just hasn't one, been one single track from day one and you were exactly. born and you're like, this is how it's gonna go. Right. So now you're here, uh, spoiler alert, they are not brand new graduates coming out of Georgia Tech who decided the first thing they wanted to do in their careers was to uh, was start a company, see what the startup life's about. Yeah. So why, and, and, and I know you both have, have been entrepreneurial in your journeys, I'm not saying this is the first time, yeah. but, but, but why now? You're clearly smart, you could get lots of money not to deal with all the hassles that come with <laughs> starting a company because if, if startups were easy, everyone Nobody would do it. Do it. Yeah. So, so what the heck are you thinking? <laughs> that's, that's what I need to know. <laughs> and let, let's start with you real quick, Barbara. Um, so I've done this three times, Alex. So I'm, I'm definitely crazy. I'm a serial, <laughs> serial entrepreneur. Um, for me, it's the excitement. 
I guess it's from being a mother. I know they're all young, so they don't know about this yet. But it's it, for me, being a mother, being able to create this life from me and see it blossom and grow. Both of my daughters are, are grown women now, and just you know, watching them grow up, I think that's part of me, like being a mother, seeing something that I created grow into this beautiful thing that I, I had, uh, you know, uh, uh, I helped to create. And so that's what I see with my companies as well, is I, I think of an idea that's just in my head, and now I'm able to make that come to life and, you know, be something that people need and want. And so with my other two companies, the first company, fresh out of college, I was fresh out of school, like you guys joined a startup in Austin, Texas, and we built the first ever, um, like, what I call pretty POS system. They used to be like real small screens and really calculators back in the day. We bought the, we built the first like, you know, big GUI based, big screen, touch screen, um, point of sale system. And to just kind of think of these ideas in our head and then we see, we walk into to the store, there's our software being used by companies like Home Depot and Sears and, you know, Home, uh, Pet Boys. And just to know that we were thinking of this stuff, drawing diagrams and here it is real life working for like years. And so, for me, that's why I keep doing this, is just that ability to create something from nothing and see it come to life and really work excites me. I know it's always hard to do it, but when we finally accomplish it, it's nothing better than that feeling of you know seeing your customers using what you thought of a few years ago. So that's why I keep doing it, Alex. And it's a great point about uh, kids being startup. All three of us are parents. Yeah. I will tell you that the ROI on kids as startups is horrific for a very long time, <laughs> but Hopefully it pays off it in the end when off. you really need them. So <laughs> just 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 know that the burn rate is high, oh, yeah. and, and and it goes on for a while. All right, Mike. So so same while. question to you. What the heck are you thinking? Yeah. So, um, I you know, being a first generation immigrant, it's kind of like you, you got to do it right. That entrepreneurship's in in the veins. So I, I didn't get a chance to do it earlier in my career. You know, part of the challenges was it took 18 years to become a U.S. citizen. So wow. So that was. Um, I worked for a company that gave me the opportunity to be an entrepreneur within a large company. You know, I've done, even though I haven't started my own startups before this one, I've started a business from zero. I've grown it to 20 million before. I've ran a hundred million revenue business before. Nice. I ran a business in Europe that was 500 million. So I've, one of the things that I would say has been um, great for me is that I've seen different stages of a business and what it requires. So you could you have seen something starting from scratch. It was two of us and we're scrappy and we're building it, even though mm -hmm. it was sponsored by a large corporate, but we're still building it from scratch. And that became a 20 person team. So I've taken it from zero to 20 yeah. and we're doing 20 million in revenue. So that was great. And then I ran a hundred million size business. It's very different. You know, it's, it requires different skills. It di requires different processes. It's all about scale. It's all about, you know, so that was different. And then larging, running something in another, on another continent was even, even more complex because now you got 30 different countries that we're dealing with different languages, different cultures, mm -hmm. uh, how they do business. And some of, those, you know, some of those countries were losing money and some of them were making money. We wanted to go Eastern Europe heavy, invest in those. So that, again, you get a lot of entrepreneurial experiences in different stages of your career, which were helpful for me. And then at some point, uh, you know, after 16 years with a $20 billion plus dollar company, I was sick of politics, honestly. Like, I was done. I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to deal with politics. I don't want to be, you know. And when I came back from Europe, my European expat assignment, I got recruited by a you know, private equity startup, a uh, private equity com co company that was purchased by a private equity. That, so I helped. That's how I got into automotive, learned about this problem. And I was always searching for, you know, I want to start a business. I don't know what. What is the problem I'm going to solve? And yeah. here it was on the platter in the middle of COVID. So I quit very my, lucra my very lucrative job and uh, started the business from scratch. And it was wow. I was the original founder. I recruited my three other co-founders. And on May 10th of 2021, we got in a two office cubicle at Atlanta Tech Village <laughs> and started making phone calls. <laughs> <laughs> and so we're doing, uh, I mean, we're, We'll do about 15 million in revenue this year. So, wow, nice. And I'd say, just as I've gotten to know uh, Barbara and Mike over the past year, one of the things that resonates, because particularly in an early stage startup, at least as I see it, it's the jockey, not the horse. Give me a compelling founder with a so so idea. I'm much more interested 
than a uh, compelling idea led by a so-so founder. And for both, uh, and I say this often, regardless of whatever widget you're building, the Venn diagram on what it takes to have that early stage startup go from an idea to something scalable uh, and into a viable business, it's 80 to 90%. It's the same blocking and tackling that comes along regardless of whether your solution is deep tech or it's a very straightforward marketing SaaS play. And the clarity around the ideas and the solutions that both Barbara and Mike have exhibited and continue to demonstrate every day, but also their openness to taking the market feedback. Yeah. Too many founders fall so in love with their idea and they can't look in the mirror and say, you know what, I've got a blemish here, a blemish here. It's just, it's not on the table. And, and you know, if you're Adam Newman and Andreessen Horowitz gives them $350 million again because they didn't Google you, cool, you can get away with that. <laughs> but if you're not that, and don't consider yourself a messiah. I think you set yourself up to a uh, better opportunity. Exactly. And if Adam's watching, apologies, not really. Uh, <laughs> so one other thing I just want to touch on, then we're going to get to some questions from, from the audience, both here in the room and, and those joining us online, uh, is for myself. And it's, again, back to the why do entrepreneurial stuff. Yeah. So much like Mike, I quit a good paying job with benefits and a regular paycheck and all those fun things that come with it to go out and start another company because I was miserable. I just couldn't do it anymore. And I loved my boss, but it was just, you weren't gonna change the world from the side of a global organization. And you probably shouldn't be allowed to. That's probably good guardrails yeah, to keep. Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, and I have friends who right out of college, they went, became lawyers, doctors, whatever it may be, landed great jobs and they've stayed there and that's been their career trajectory. Yeah. And they tell me that they are now 27 years into their careers being whatever the heck they're doing. And I think they're crazy. I think they're nuts. And they look at me and I'm like, I'm quitting another good job to start something new and I have no idea if it'll work. And they think I'm nuts and we just exactly. can't, we can love each other and respect each other, but it's just so different. Exactly. And you just can't typically align those mindsets to do both. Mm -hmm. it's, it, it's not completely binary, but it's something very close to that. Yeah. So let's, uh, let's find out what the audience wants to hear about because we might've been completely wrong this whole time and now they're really annoyed. But uh, so let's start with, uh, a couple of questions from the room, and then Andy will check if stuff is coming in online. But candidly, y'all know the most about what you want to hear most. So uh, let's start. I'll just come around when you've got a question so we can make sure everyone can hear you. But uh, who's brave enough to go first? And I will call on someone. <laughs> Probably someone typing. There we go. Oh, All right. Brave soul. <laughs> you took one for the team. So very quickly, just to name what you're studying or why you're here and yeah. what you do. So uh, I am Anish. So I am pursuing master's in supply chain engineering. I mean, I think the whole class is from supply chain engineering. <laughs> so uh, especially, so my question is to Mike. So uh, basically what I think is customer acquisition is the most difficult part when you start selling an idea. So how have you managed to uh, convince the dealerships and customers and even truckers to be on board with your platform? And what, ha what, what has been the most significant challenge in getting them on board? It's a good, good question. question. It's a good question. Good question. So again, as a, as a marketplace, you have two kind of customers that you need, to, you, need to, uh, you, you need to have to play. So in our scenario, we go after dealerships and auto auctions. That's the first equation. We go after them, we land the business, we have cars to move, and then the car hauler just come because we have the volume. Because again, if, if you remember what I mentioned earlier, a lot of those car haulers, it's small operation, maybe husband and wife, uh, they don't have a large sales team, they're not, you know, and when you pick up a vehicle from one place to another, you deliver somewhere. So let's say you go from Atlanta to Chicago, now you're in Chicago, you don't, know, you don't have any contacts. What are you gonna do? So that's where we come in and help them kind of fill some of those voids. But, um, First, it was really, you know, first when we start calling around, we started to call around to see, identify if there's a problem. And it wasn't even like, we're trying to sell, hey, would you want us to do this? Like, we didn't know what the hell we were doing. So we just started calling around and started learning very quickly that transportation was a big pain point for, for dealerships and auto auctions. They generally never knew where the car was, when the car was getting picked up, when it was gonna be delivered. So that's a constant question. The other thing that we learned very quickly is they didn't really care how much they pay. 
So um, that was very interesting because they just wanted the car. So a lot of our customers that once you build that, it's very, you know, automotive is a very small world. That's one other thing to say is it's a very small world. Everybody kind of knows each other. So once you get in, like 30% of our business is referrals. We don't advertise. It's all like referrals from our customers that are happy with our, with our service, which is a great way to earn business, of course. But that's, those are the things that we found out was that they just want their cars very quickly and good communication. And if we can deliver on those two things, they don't really care about the rates. Again, because there's a trust developed, they're going to charge a fair fee for the service that we provide. Um, and that's kind of how we got started. We landed one auction. Uh, that was our first customer. We landed at one auto auction. And then we, we started doing some regular business with them. Then we landed another one because now we knew the formula that worked. How do we solve their one auctions problem? Then we went to all the other auctions and we started kind of copy and repeat. And similarly with dealerships, then we first, for like probably about eight months, we mostly just did auction business. Um, and then we started going after the dealerships, learned their process, harder to reach. They don't check their emails and uh, very hard to get them on the phone. So a lot of the sales that we do is in person. We go to the dealership and then you know someone and then they connect with other people and it's all like referral business through and and you get text messages, which is like crazy, mind blowing. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, it was uh, learning the market, understanding what the problem we're trying to solve, um, and really making it very seamless for our customers. That because ultimately all of them are in buying or selling car business. They're not in the shipping business. They just don't care. They just want an asset to be in the point where it needs to be. Um, and that's what we help them solve. That's good. Barbara, what was your, come right to the question second, what was your customer acquisition strategy when you were just getting started with freeing returns? Yeah, so ours was is similar, only it's on the retail side. And so um, the retailers that have like the really big issues with returns and operational inefficiencies are grocery retailers. So that's really where we started is, is um, trying to get in the door with grocery retailers. Um, since I work for the startup company um, fresh out of college, they got, um, we got acquired by Oracle Corporation. They bought our point of sale software and just started selling that all over the world. Um, I became a consultant for that type of software. And so I had been having years of working with retailers. Home Depot was our first client. So you can imagine how big that is to have Home Depot as your first client. But just same thing, word of mouth, retailers started hearing about us, the work we were doing. We started getting referrals for other retailers. Uh, we started looking at issues these retailers were having, and then we um, built the product, which is free in return. So a lot of our uh, initial first customers came from people that knew us from that point of sale startup that, that got acquired by Oracle. Um, and then, you know, a lot of my friends who were with that startup went to work for Oracle. So I have contacts there. They were our first partner. And then it's been word of mouth. So we, we know it's a small ecosystem also in retail. Everybody knows each other. And so we're, you know, we're considered um, subject matter experts in our space. And so we've been able to get in the door with some really big retailers that for a company our size, you wouldn't think that we would get in the door with. So just knowing that ecosystem, uh, word of mouth referrals and having some of that secret sauce by being bought out early from um, a company like Oracle. All right, next question, who are you? Oh, my name's Gabe, but I'm also doing supply chain engineering. Um, so recently I actually was like looking for Sorry, this goes to Michael. So recently I was looking for services to use to ship my car from here to California. And I spent like a week researching and I selected like Move Auto, if you know, Move Auto. Um, and I'm just curious, like how do you differ from like all these other companies? Because it's a very competitive market. It's so, like what's your kind of like competitive advantage and like how do you utilize that to kind of lure in customers? So the pooling is really the big part that we focus on heavily. And the reason for that is, so there is, the market is made up of multiple different players. You have the trucking companies that actually move the vehicles, right? And then you have these intermediaries that basically um, try to, because it's a symmetry of information, right? You don't know who to reach out to, you don't know the trucker. So they may have access to the trucker that you don't have and they you hire them to move it. However, that means that they have that one car from Atlanta to California. That doesn't mean they don't have it. they have other cars. 
and the job is left to the trucker to fill in the rest of the car, rest of the, the space on the trailer. And he, it may take him a day, it depends how many phone calls he makes, I guess, right? How fast he works to fill up the truck, because ultimately, if he doesn't have the truck filled up, he's not moving your car. Uh, or he doesn't want to commit to moving your car until he has a couple more spots filled in. So we try to focus on getting a few vehicles already at the same time so the trucker has to do less work. We can't fill up his whole truck, but we can fill in uh, several spots. So when we fill in those spots, as soon as I have two, it, it starts moving much faster and the cost starts to go down. Uh, and that's really core of our focus is through our technology, how do we, because plus we have a bigger pool of customers that we're pulling from bundling these vehicles. So as we're able to do that, the speed increases, then I can also guarantee the day of a pickup because a lot of times, I don't know if you experienced this, but they may tell you a range of days. Hey, we need three to five days. I can always guarantee day of a pickup. Mm. Uh, I can't always guarantee the delivery until I know like, how much I've filled in the trailer. And then based on that, then I could give you a, you know, there's usually a driver can drive 500 miles per day, but if he has multiple stops along the way, things could slow down because, you know, you know, Mary, maybe he's dropping off a car at somebody else's house, somebody else's house, they're not home, get delayed traffic, I mean, a million things can happen across mm -hmm. country track. So those are the things that we try to pre-build uh, buffers to say like, this is when your vehicle is going to be delivered, so it's more precise. So we have built out some technology to help us do that versus a lot of these companies that, you know, it's all just like, oh, I'm going to guess, you know, it's going to be three to eight days. Well, great. That doesn't really help me very much. Um, and that's kind of how we try to differentiate on precision of pickup, precision on delivery, and giving you proper ETA, better communication. Because uh, ultimately, the, like the apps and the technology that you've, we have, you don't really care about that. You don't want another app on your phone. All you want to know is that when the car is going to be picked up, when it's going to be delivered. And through our technology, we try to reduce error and create precision of when your vehicle is going to be picked up and delivered. And I'll hopefully optimize cost. And Barbara, you're not alone in the space either. So what no. differentiates you from the many companies that are also looking at addressing this issue? Yeah, so for us, um, you know, we're different from our com competition because most of our competitors are looking at fraud. You know, that's really their claim to fame as they help retailers identify fraudulent transactions. So we do that as well, because everybody wants to know if, if this is fraudulent. But we also look at um, shrink, which if you guys don't know what shrink is, it's basically, um, you know, for them losing money that they can actually control. Uh, it's usually some type of internal, uh, it could be fraud, but it may be just things that they're doing wrong. Um, operational inefficiencies, are they not ordering enough product so their shelves are empty, which they're losing money. So that's what makes us different is we don't only look at fraud that's happening for them, we also look at shrink and operational inefficiencies. And so um, a lot of retailers now are, are looking for um, solutions that are more than just catching bad guys. They want to know how, how, how am I losing money and what can I do to stop the losses, especially now in this economy when you know every dollar counts for retailers so that's what we're different is we look at what we call total loss versus just the fraud okay, uh, my question is for mike as well um, who, who are you um, i'm omar also a supply chain engineer um my question is basically how do you deal with the damages that happen in like the transportation process if there are any damages that occur and then you also talked about like the um customer um customer satisfaction, like customer experience. Um, how do you deal with, uh, for example, the points of contact between the long haulers and the customers themselves? How do you ensure that they're talking to the customers in the right way, ensuring that they're there, um, giving them just basically what they actually need coming to you instead of like going just to any other trucker? Great question. You want a job? I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, so, so twofold. Um, well, the first part of the question was around how do you deal with the damages? The, and damage, like the damages. So, yeah. the um, one of the first things that we do is all, all the transports on our platform get vetted for operating authority, their safety record, their uh, insurance. So, generally, the cargo when the cargo is moving on their trailer, they're responsible for the for the for the damages on the trailer. Let's say something happens, um, we have our own contingent cargo policy. And then on top of that, we have an umbrella policy. 
if something happens, we still, insurance is covered. And one of the things that to kind of further let's say, how do we differentiate ourselves? A lot of times, the transport, the, our competitors, if damage happens, they'll give you the phone number of the trucker. Here, good luck. Go deal with that guy to uh, collect the money for the damages. We take the control of the entire transaction from the A to Z. So if damage happens, if you can't get communicated, we pay you. So I write you a check and then I go collect the check from their insurance company. So my interaction is with the client always. Then the same way, because um, again, that once you don't control the interaction with the customer, things could get really messy and the experience could get really bad. So we, the trucker doesn't even have the customer's phone number. So one of the things that, uh, and again, like most of our business is B2B right now for those exact reasons, because mm -hmm. you start dealing with consumers, they're finicky, yeah. right? I mean, you, you want, you have, the expectations are very different than a dealership that receives thousands of cars. So, but we do some, it's word of mouth. I mean, they find us somehow, I don't know, but they, they find us and we move those cars. So uh, how we interact with them is they're always talking to carpool employee. The only first time they'll have an interaction with the driver when the driver actually shows up in the driveway. And obviously we instruct them for certain behavior, but that's the only time they're gonna have interaction versus a lot of times our, what our competitors do is they give a phone number to the driver, Driver's not responding. Experience starts to get, go down automatically because the driver's driving. He doesn't. He's not giving you an update, right? That's not his job. Is to deliver the car. He, he doesn't consider his job to be the communication. Um, so we take that on in house and we carry the communication all along. So the first thing when the, let's say a consumer takes an order, it get, gives us an order, they'll get a text message saying, "Hey, this is carpool. Uh, any questions?" This is come to us, you can call this number anytime or text us for any updates. These are live people that will respond to you at all times. So that communication already starts on a kind of in a good way. And then if any, there's any changes, because again, logistics is messy. There's always something that's gonna come up. It's like all we do every day is how to solve for things that are already, they're gonna happen in the future <laughs> or prevent them. Mm -hmm. um, so, and the communication goes a long way. How do you communicate with the customer? You know, we, we move cars for people that are moving. So like, this is the day I'm moving. This car cannot be here tomorrow because I'm not gonna be here. Because the moving truck's moving the rest of my stuff. So those are the things that, understanding those situations, how you deal with them are, is very important. So we take that into consideration and that's how we want to differentiate ourselves. So really heavy on customer service. So Barbara, uh, along the same lines, understanding that your solution is not as customer focused right. or customer facing, I should say, as, as you have with Mike's solution. But what is a way uh, you've discussed from a technology standpoint, how you're differentiating, you're looking at much more information to come up with trends that can then point the retailer to the right solution. Mm -hmm. What is the, it's easy when in that situation to step back and say, well, it's just a big machine and it runs and what the heck are you going to do and pull yeah. the human component out of it? How does Spring Returns work that human component back in when you're engaging with the customer? Yeah, yeah, we have, you know, one of our, um, one of our uh, monetary strategies is to actually offer like a, what we call a white glove service to some of the retailers we work with. So these are ones that may have like really complicated issues, complicated supply chain issues. So we will have some of our um, consultants actually work with them to kind of uh, close up some of the gaps in their technology or in their processes. And then, you know, whatever monies we are able to help them gain by this white glove service, then um, we keep 10% of whatever that, that value is. And so that is something that we offer where we bring actual humans in that can act as these subject matter experts to work with that retail chain to figure out like, you know, what are their issues that the technology doesn't catch because it's probably operational or training issues, things like that. Close those gaps so that we get all that data into the platform, which makes it better, but then share in the gain. So if we save them $10 million, we take 1%. So it's not like they're having to pay a million dollars to us. We just gave them 10 million. They're giving us 1 million out of that. And so we offer that as well as it's our white glove service that we offer. Okay. All right, next question. I, I'm not kidding. I will stop somewhere and have you ask a question. Here we go. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm Pim, so I'm a supply chain engineering student. So I have a question for Barbara. 
So you mentioned a lot of fraudulent um, transaction. Um, yeah. Could you explain in more um, technical detail, like how do they detect that apart from like opening the box and finding out that, oh, that yeah. it's not what they, they have? Yeah, so, so um, returns fraud, I think they have so many, like I've heard people talking about different like um, TV shows where they're like, Barbara, I heard about returns fraud, even though it was a thing that they were talking about it on the show. So there's like 18 known ways that people commit returns fraud um, that we know of. They're probably thinking of others, but um, you know, just a few of them that you know you guys probably have heard of. Um, there's people that will buy, mer you know, buy an item um, that they wear on the weekends while they're partying, and then they return it every Monday. So they do this all over the place. They buy their going out for the weekend clothes, and then Mondays they return it, and they do this across the board. That's called wardrobing. That's one way they do it. Um, another one, <laughs> another one is uh, what's called item not received fraud. So people will have something delivered to their house, and even though the driver took a picture of it, they say, "Well, I got home, is nothing's there. Like it disappeared. It's not on my porch. I don't know what happened." It's really hard for retailers to prove that it was there because they may be using a different company to fulfill that last mile. They might have used Instacart or DoorDash or somebody to do it. So they can't really prove that the item really was um, left on the porch, even if it's a picture. And we also have video of drivers taking the picture and then coming back, grabbing the item and leaving after they took the picture. So it's hard to prove that. So it's a thing called item not received fraud, where a lot of the frosters will use that and say, I never got it, you know, send me another one. So they really have two and they sell one, return the other. So they got two times the money. That's item not received fraud. And then, um, you know, there's the stolen credit card fraud where they basically steal somebody's credit card, um, order expensive items, it gets delivered because, you know, every retailer is trying to deliver like Amazon within hours instead of usually two or three days. So they get it so fast, by the time that person realizes their credit card was stolen and they stop the transaction, um, the retailer is the last one that gets their money because the customer will get their money back from the bank. The bank files it as a chargeback but the retailer is out because they don't get paid for that item. So that's chargeback fraud, payments fraud. It's 18 that we know about. Those are just three that you guys probably have heard of, but it's just so many tactics that people are thinking of in order to defraud retailers. And as the technology gets better, then the frosters have even more ways that they're able to do this. So it's a cat and mouse game, but we're, we're catching them as fast as we can. <laughs>my first original co-founder is somebody that I worked with in the past. Mm -hmm. um, we worked together and we've been, you know, we, we were in the freight business. We were actually spending a lot of time with returns. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we ran a large distribution hub for, you know, we're consolidating pallets instead of cars at that time for large retailers like Walmart and CVS and our hubs, um, which shrinkage and all those problems. So we've been through, um, a lot of challenges and a lot of good opportunities together. So I knew he had what it took to, to be successful. So I, I made two phone calls when I was decided on this idea. I already had my business plan built out. Everything's built. I made two phone calls and um, one of those guys, weirdly enough, said yes. And then he actually followed through and quit his job when we were starting the business. So. Um, so that was that was great. I mean, like, it, lonely founder is very hard. Yeah. So lonely founder is very hard. It's it's a hard journey. Yeah. And then interestingly enough, we we're at Atlanta Tech Village. It was two of us, and we had an outsourced partner that was building um, our platform that was not very, going very well. And next door to us were two guys that used to have a thirty-person software development shop, and they sold their business and their tinkering, trying to figure out what they're going to do next. Actually, our first interaction was they told us to be quiet on the first day because we're all giddy. <laughs> so we're like, who are these jackasses? But anyways, uh, six months later, they became our co-founders. <laughs> and they're technical, obviously. One, was the, one of the guys is very good at like software development. The other is a product guy. So now we have four people that own specific lanes. Yeah. Now own sales and partnerships and fundraising and Eric owns operations, and Joe and Terrence run, build our product. So we don't heavily, we run the business, we move cars, and we have a team that builds our software. We have like 15 Perfect. people that are software development uh, analysts and so on that 
are very focused on that. So that's those are the that's the foundation, and then from there we start you know, recruiting people, building out different functions. Um, but yeah, now we have like middle manage, couple middle managers as well, so that it's not just on four of us to do everything, which is very important as you continue to scale. So we have about 32 people uh, and 10 contractors. So, is yeah. it one personality type that you're looking for more more than any other? Obviously, you need a diverse mix. Yeah, uh, personality type. I mean, honestly, like I look for people that ask good questions. So in an interview. If somebody's not asking questions, eh, it's a big no-no for me because that means you either don't know what you're getting into uh, or you haven't done enough research. Yeah, to me that, so the, uh, questions is very important. Uh, again, we're startups, so it's a lot of work. This is not easy. This is not for everyone. So, yeah. I mean, I, I don't sleep very much. You know, mm. you know, the mind is always thinking about the business. Yeah. And not everybody's going to be that way, of course, but the people that I give equity to need to be. That's how, that, those are the differentiators for me. The salary is to do your job. Bonus is to do your job really well. Equity is to think outside the box and help us build the business. Exactly. All right, Barbara, so how did you build out your team? Yeah. And also the question about is there one thing personality trait wise that you kind of prioritize over others? Yeah, yeah. For me, um, since I've been a part of two other startups and re retail is a very small ecosystem, um, a lot of the people that were uh, part of those other two startups are with me now. So, we, you know, I've known these people for 20 years. So mine wasn't that hard. It was just, you know, we've done this before, built companies, sold them. And so we're doing it. This is our three-peat. Uh, we're trying to get the three-peat in this time. But um, af after we kind of got that core team together, um, I actually pulled from Georgia Tech. Like our CTO is a Georgia Tech grad. She worked for me fresh out of college. I hired her fresh out of Georgia Tech, trained her on retail technology. You know, she's probably better than me now because she eclipsed me and went off to work for a retail automotive, uh, a retail um, automotive technology company in Austin, Texas. They got acquired and I contacted her to say, hey, why don't you come back and be our CTO? She came back to be the CTO. So mine has been just relationships, either from people that I've trained and nurtured up, and now that you know they come back and join me, or people that I've been in business with before, and you know, and they come back now. So it's been a lot of just you know reusing the people that I already know, um, and then for the people coming in now, we we just um, we closed our seed round last year. We raised like three million dollars, and we hired. Uh, we have about probably twenty five people in the company now. So a lot of these new people are people I don't know. They're kind of just coming in. So I look for people that are entrepreneurial. That's one of the questions we ask them is, you know, do you, are you a nine to five type person? Or are you more like an entrepreneur type that's, you know, um, ready to come in, get your hands dirty and build something uh, from nothing. And so we really hire the people that are entrepreneurial. Um, they want to see something grow. They want to be a part of the team. They want to be part of something bigger than they are. Those are the ones we hire, not the person that just wants to work nine to five and go home at the end of the day, because that's not the startup's life. So that's what we look for. All right, well, thank you for that. All right, one more good question. You're doing so, so far so good, which is what we would expect. Great question. Who's gonna bring us home? And then I've got a two and a half hour monologue on startups. <laughs> but there will be a test on afterwards. A test after that. <laughs> one more question. Any ladies? I see all the ladies in the audience. No questions from the ladies. Any ladies have questions? Don't be shy. Okay, I won't pick on y'all. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll, we'll, we'll do this quickly and then we'll come back for that question from, from uh, the ladies in the room. Who here has worked in a warehouse carrying that 50 pound box? Let's say Georgia in August. <laughs> in it, August. It, it can be anywhere in the world. I'm just saying, who's like literally been in the warehouse, not for a tour, not to go and you know tinker on a, a workstation, <laughs> but to it. actually be the person. Nope. You're running a pallet jack, you're moving a forklift, <laughs> you're just carrying boxes, you're offloading. Okay, all right, not bad. Uh, me, done it no, not a me. lot of times. It stinks, it's mm -hmm. awful. So uh, wherever you go in your journey, one thing I would ask that you keep in mind is that historically in supply chain, 
And it is great to see so many women in the room because, mm -hmm. as we know, Adelaide. it's one of the highlights of, of this year in the conferences. I was at a conference. There was a female founder presenting Total Badass. And <laughs> she said, where are my white males at? And 80% of the room raises their hand. She said, it's been a rough couple of years, huh? <laughs> so we need that diversity of thought and background and experience in so many ways, particularly in an aging industry like supply chain, where there isn't enough talent coming in to fill all these critical roles. And we're all well aware supply chain is not going away. You're not going to just dial it in, get it figured out, and then set yeah. it and forget you it. You always have a job. Yes, you always have guaranteed. A job. <laughs> with, with, always. Without question. But as you're creating solutions in whatever format you, you are, whatever role you're in, one thing uh, that I am adamant about, Tim and I have discussed this at great length, it is a low tech industry when it comes down to the person that's actually gonna make the thing happen. As, as Mike has talked about, that person who is going to haul the vehicles, it's gonna get his money revenue, very low tech. For Barbara, as you're dealing with that end person who's standing on the front line in a major retailer, deciding whether or not to take a, a yeah. return back based yeah. on whatever the policies are, that is typically not gonna be a very high tech person who you exactly. can give a very complex machine to and expect them to figure it out. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been in startups, I've used Salesforce basically since it was born. I'm still not very good at it because of its complexity. Mm -hmm. So as you're thinking about solutions, understand that it's gonna go down to a very low tech individual. And if you give them a tool that could be brilliant, perfectly crafted, yeah. born out of Georgia Tech, the brightest minds worked on it. But if it doesn't make sense and the person who's gonna wind up holding that tool can't understand the value it brings him or her in their everyday job, it goes on the shelf and that's money wasted and nothing's improved. And that is the worst possible outcome. Yeah. So think that through anything you can do to get out there and live it and feel it and know what that burn is like to be awake at three in the morning, you know, to have done it going for the third time. Yeah. Those are the things that, that really matter. So let's get one more question uh, per Barbara's request. And <laughs> the ladies on the spot. <laughs> Come on, ladies, one question. There we go. All right. Woo. Woo. My question is, who, who are you? Uh, oh yeah, uh, my name is Chong and I'm also a supply chain engineering student. So uh, my question for you guys is what make you choose logistic? Cause it's not something that's really fancy. It's not like, yeah. <laughs> you know, not sexy. it's not <laughs> AI. <laughs> uh, well, kind of AI related, I guess for Barbara, but like yeah. what make you choose logistic out of everything That's a good question. Else? Good question. I do. love that's it. Good question. It's a great question. Um, but you go, go for, go you applauded, so you yeah. get to go oh, okay. first. Sure. <laughs> Um, for me, it actually chose me because um, we I was working with a bunch of retailers and um, looking, you know, looking for something where we could kind of get out of consulting and build a product or a platform. And um, the retailers were telling us, here's the challenge. Like, we can't see what's going on with all this data that we're collecting. We can't see, you know, some of these losses that are occurring. So I hadn't planned to get into this. It wasn't like, OK, I'm looking for a supply chain. It was actually customer pain that we felt like, oh, wow, we can solve this. And so we got into it that way. Um, I'm computer science, point of sale systems, you know, technology. I've had to hire and bring in people that know loss prevention and fraud to help us build the tech out. So uh, my, you know, understanding is the technology underneath it, but all those algorithms on how to detect fraud and different things like that, I hired people that had that expertise. So. It was the customers that, that brought it to us because this was their pain, they need somebody to solve it. And we were like, we'll do it, we'll solve it. That's how I got into it. Yeah, similarly, I, I kind of fell into uh, logistics as well. So in an undergrad, I was a finance major and I was about to graduate right after 9-11 with a finance degree as an international student. Not a good time. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody stopped hiring international students right after 9-11. So, um, I had an option of staying one semester extra and getting a logistics degree that I just didn't know anything about. And I was like, all right, I'll, you know, I'll stay one, one more semester and get a logistics degree on top of my finance degree, do a double major. They give me more options to find a job. Mm -hmm. um, and that's kind of how I fell into it. I got a logistics degree, I got a logistics job right out of college, and I stayed in it and enjoyed it because it's, it's always uh, tons of problems to solve. Again. Very low tech industry over time, it's improved, but, and now you, it's the combination of finance, combination of 
supply chain knowledge is very useful because it's a lot of analytics, a lot of yeah. numbers, a lot of crunching, trying to make it more efficient. So there's, it's, it's worked out for me from a career stamp, standpoint. And generally, you know, you hear a lot about the sexy startups that like Facebooks and you know, nobody wants another Facebook for cats, right? So <laughs> it's, it's about solving real life problems and these yeah. are real life problems yeah. um, that is interesting to solve. So that's, you know, I stayed yeah. with it. Uh, Barbara gave a shout out to her alma mater, University of Texas at Austin. What, what's yours? Let's get some controversy yeah, going here. So I, for undergrad, I went to Georgia Southern, and uh, oh, so and then my grad school, I went to Emory. So sorry, Georgia. <laughs> See, great ideas can come from outside of Georgia Tech. <laughs> Tim is just giving me the daggers from the back. Kill, but. kill it now! Kill it now! Alex. Georgia Southern had a good supply chain program. For earlier on, so I don't know. They do it. now. They continue to. Do. They have a strong yeah. As does Georgia Tech. The supply chain is so Absolutely. so complex. There will not be one solution that's going to work. We need more and more people flowing into it, all the backgrounds, all the experiences. That's going to be it. So as we wrap up, uh, first of all, round of applause for our panelists. <laughs> Thank you to Tim and Andy for pulling this off and everyone at the Supply Chain and Logistics Institute for just another wonderful year and great seminars and wonderful topics all around. Thank you. And, uh, and to everyone who in the room or online who joined us, thanks for being here. <laughs> this is the applause section. I've got an idea, it's Uber for applause. <laughs> but finally, uh, looking out at this room, and I imagine the same is true for those of us joining online, uh, there's a lot of talent, a ton of opportunity. You're starting your journey, you're on your journey, you're winding down your journey, whatever that looks like. Uh, my ask is, don't be afraid to quit or get fired. Be brave. Try something that scares you. It's, it's a better road. Thank you, everyone, for being here. And we will be around for a few questions if you want to talk one-on-one. -on -one. Thanks again. Thank you. Have Thank a great you. day. That was fun. Funny, too.